everybody. My name is Carol King, and I am the developer of Custom Home Builder Solutions, also known as CHS, which, as the name says, is the solution for professional custom home builders for handling all of their job costing and very unique accounting requirements. CHS includes so many features that home builders came together and asked me to include based on best practices and based on both my accounting degree with honors and on my heavy experience in the back offices of home builders. They told me about how so much of the software out there seemed to be more for production builders than for custom builders and that they have their own very specific needs to handle their unique jobs. So, my goal was to pull together the accounting and all the tools for job costing. That was needed so that in the back office, the accounting team was not spending so many hours making lots of spreadsheets to produce variance reports for job costs, draw request billings, insurance audit reports, figuring out cash flow and cash balances by job, where job costs and gross profit are heading on each job, and on and on and on. One of the things that takes up the most time in a custom home builder's back office for a bookkeeper is to enter all those job cost bills from all those subcontractors. Now I have some things scrolling across the screen because one of my primary things I wanted to accomplish was to enter all of those actual job cost bills one time, have it show up everywhere without making all of those spreadsheets. What I'd like you to do is pause this for a minute and read the list that just displayed. What we're going to do is go enter a bill one time and I'm going to show you how it shows up on all of these things. So here we are inside the CHS program and I am on the main menu which is a colored one which you can choose to not have a colored one as you come in and one of the things I wanted to point out that you will be using so much is this button called Active Jobs Dashboard which I've already clicked and opened and I've selected the job that we're going to be working with to enter a bill right here. Now you can see once I select that there's all sorts of things that we can look at for the job which we will be doing as we go through this. First of all I open the job budget worksheet in a tab already right here that's showing various budget totals and marked up totals etc and also they set a price. This one is actually a fixed price contract. Once they got all their numbers in, they put in that they wanted a 20% profit. CHS suggested a price to use to get that 20% profit, so they decided to use that. They could have put in a higher amount. And we'll be coming back to how this price gets revised. And also that this is the budget place, and you click on a line and you start working on something. Here's the slab contract that we're going to be entering a bill for. And you can see they have an attachment here for the original bid that they did. Notice he went ahead and budgeted for 34.4, which is what the amount of that bid was that we just opened. Then the next thing on the jobs dashboard is the big important screen that you should go through to all the time, which is the estimated cost at completion, which I have open right here. And you can see that budget amount coming in right here. You can also see some variance POs. But before I leave the idea of budgets, I'd like to show you a couple of things. I'm going to do a budget for another job that's a cost plus builder fee that one of my builders let me have to show you. This person has entered links to bids from Outdoor Design, I believe, right here. It's the original bid from them. So if you send this budget to one of your home buyers and you're being all open and transparent with them, you could be like this builder and just write all kinds of notes to the buyer. For the slab contract, it looks like he uploaded a copy of the plans for the buyer. That's just your choice. You can upload whatever it is you want to attach here that would show up on the budget along with all of your notes. Now this I'm showing you so that you will understand what powerful budget proposal CHS can prepare and that you control what title. You might have one called proposal something up here. You can also add header text in here around the job to give them a description of what this is about. I think he puts notes at the bottom in the footer, and this comes down, and it's a cost plus builder fee. Now, the job we're going to be looking at to enter a bill is called the Loveman job. Now, I printed one that's not really so much for the home buyer that has in italics internal notes, and then things I've uploaded in the buyer notes, and it shows both the budget and the marked up amount. Now, this is a fixed price, and it has a price set on it, etc which we will see on the budget here in a minute, but I wanted you to see how you could open both the budget and the marked up 
And if we go to that line that I'm going to be focusing on to enter a bill, which is the 2105 slab contract, you can see the budget was this amount and marked up was this amount. So for a fixed contract, you usually give to the home buyer. This is one where you put the header as job budget proposal, has some verbiage for that. And all you're seeing is marked up amounts, and it doesn't say the word markup or budget. They're just seeing the marked up amounts that you entered on the budget so that they can come down and total to what their price is right here and see their proposal. And also one really handy thing is you can print by stages. Stages are things that you'll, you'll set up your cost codes and you'll attach certain stages. You set up your stages. We tr say you should keep them kind of simple. But this is real cool because it's the marked up amounts and it kind of gives you a little forecast of how much you might be drawing from the customer. That's all I wanted to show you right there. Let's get on to entering that bill without taking too long. But you might look at this budget. Let me show you something else, a keyword search, because I want to focus in on slab contract. And I typed in slab already, search for keywords. So I just get this line so we can look at it. You're going to get some clues. You, let's drill down on this original budget for a second. It says update bid was for $13.19 per slab square feet, but Glenn has agreed to $12.50 per discussion. So if you drill down on the POs that were issued here, including the variance POs, and you take a look maybe at the work notes to see if you can get a clue, you can see those notes again, the PO internal notes, and why they issued a PO for this amount of 32.6 instead of the original bid. But also take a notice that the field person has typed in, when paid, we need to deduct 200 for site cleanup. That's going to be important when we enter our bill in a minute. Now we see that there's a variance PO, and it says site conditions. You can get a clue just by looking at it. But if you take a look at this variance PO and just open the whole PO up where you enter purchase orders, it says Big Buck has to charge more for soil conditions, and they selected a variance reason. What's really cool about doing variance POs is that you can set up whatever variance reasons you want and then select it and then do reports of the variance POs to see what caused you to go over or under in various places. It's very handy information. Now what I'd also like to say is that POs are a super, super communication tool. I'm going to do my keyword search again because it refreshes because I went out to do all those things. So here we are. But what I'd like to point out is that POs are really, just like you just saw, a powerful communication tool for telling you what's going on. The other thing is back on the jobs dashboard, once you issue a bunch of POs, this is really a great report to use to send to the field vendor info from POs issued. And it's giving all the phone numbers, the cost codes, and various things like that. It's really a good communication tool for the field to know who's going to be doing the work. Let's get back to the ECC. And we drilled down on those and we saw that we had done a PO for 32 something plus a 2000 PO and that's why the 34600. Now what I'd like to say because I know all of that is that I don't want this estimated cost at completion to be the budget plus the variance PO anymore. I want to use the PO's amount for my ECC and now all of a sudden it's shown me that I'm over budget only by 200 rather than 2,000 that was picking up from here. And that's because the PO we issued is $1,800 less than what the bid was. And then we issued a variance PO for 2,000. So we're getting the 200 here. So I need to quit talking about that. We'll come back to this line. And when I refresh to all the totals, we will be talking about how our bill is going to show up as part of the payables that are unpaid, part of the cash balance and a bunch of other drill downs and how the actual costs that we post are going to show up right here. All right, let's go enter an accounts payable bill for these amounts for Big Buck and see what happens to us. Let's go home. Let's do post new payables and charges from scratch. Let's select our Big Buck construction, which is that one for that slab contract. And look, it says create bills from POs because it found some POs. We're not going to actually do this, but I want you to see what happens. Let's select to see only open POs, and every one of these are for Big Buck because it knew what we were doing. And so I see all these open POs, only ones that still have balances. Notice how they'll have a place for this, a place for costs. This one still has balances. But these are different jobs that are going on. And our job is Loveman, and we could do a search and just look at the Loveman ones if we wanted. But I just wanted to see all the ones, and you can click to create a bill, and it'll just create the bill and start the bill for you. 
So I'm going to go ahead, I am going to go ahead and do one of these, and then we're going to deal with this one up here, and I can already see that somebody in the field said minus 200. But let's do create bill. Now notice that all of a sudden the first thing, whether I do it from scratch or not, is CHS goes out and checks for things to warn us about. And it's warning us that the general liability is required and is expired or low. So let me go ahead and click to view or upload the control docs. And then I'm going to do upload photo or something. And I'm going to go look for my vendor control docs folder. And I'm going to upload this certificate. And if I look at it, I'm going to see that it expires 9-30-2023. Save that. Close. What I want to do is while I'm thinking about it, I want to close and I don't want to submit this. And I want to click on the pencil edit icon right here. And I want to change this to 2023. Now normally I might have gotten this thing in either via the comments inside CHS where it would just go ahead and auto upload it for you pretty much. But I just am playing like I got it in the mail. And as I tab out of it, you're going to see, do you want to open the window for uploading? But I know I already uploaded it, so I'll say no. And I'll say save. Now I'm going to open to create a job related bill. Instead of doing that one that was straight from the PO, I think you would have gotten the idea. But I'd like you to see when I open to do a job related bill from scratch. Going to notice I don't have the general liability warning anymore, but I do see something about miscellaneous expirations that you can set up yourself to warn yourself about. And then there's something about outstanding waivers, which we're going to see waivers in a little bit. So I'm going to leave that one alone. It just means you did some waivers and you haven't marked them as being returned. Now notice that nothing is filled in like for the PO when we did it. And I could just start selecting a job. So if I do Loveman, I want you to notice that the GL number that drops in when I do Loveman is this. I want you to notice that 2105 dropped in because that's what I set up as the default for the vendor. Also, a turnkey cost type dropped in. If you know the difference between the materials and the labor, it would be good to do one that's labor here and one that's then materials by copying this line once you're done with it and doing the two different amounts. I'll just leave today's invoice date. Because of Loveman being chosen, CH department dropped in for custom homes and you can get little financials for each different department. And when you set up the job, you tell it which department and you tell it which GL account that you want job costs to be given to. Notice what happens if I select some rental one that we have, which I think starts with PM. The PM for property management dropped in and a different GL number dropped in for rental maintenance. If you're doing remodeling, it might be a cost of sales remodeling job and you might send that as your default drop in. Also, let's just go back to Loveman. See how it's switching back to 1430, which is a work in progress account, which is where most people put custom homes, job costs, etc. But now I do want to, instead of filling these amounts in, I want to see the POs for Loveman. And it moved to ones and I can see outstanding 32600. So I've selected that and let's see what happens now. And it says someone has posted an amount to deduct from this PO or has written some PO work notes about this PO. Be sure to click the PO status and approval notes link. So let's take a look at what that is in case we hadn't seen it a while ago. But you can see when paid we need to deduct $200 for site cleanup. So let's copy this, but let's first of all give it an invoice number and I usually do use six digits for the date or I might use PO807. PO807 invoice slab contract is fine with me. I do want this to be included on an NEC 1099, which is the default for this vendor, but if I didn't, I could select none. This is a fixed contract job, so the market percent that came in is sort of a moot point unless you're doing a cost plus markup job. And that's why this would drop in whatever it gets it from the budget for the cost code and drops it in because when you do cost plus markup draw requests, it will pull in all these payable bills that you entered. That's one thing about just entering a cost one time and it will mark it up to the markup that you put here. Maybe you've agreed this time not to do 25% for whatever reason for the slab, slab contract on a cost plus markup. And you could change the market percent right here that would end up on the draw request. There's full help about every one of these. But notice how my amount dropped in for me from the PO. But what's so cool is I don't have to code. If I have POs, I don't have to code what the cost code is. But let's do another copy right here of all this so it's the same PO. Notice it's the same PO. We'll just leave it attached to that PO and say 
deduction for site cleanup. Now we'll put minus 200 here. And you'll notice that now our amount has gone down to 32,400. I want to do one other thing. I want to go ahead and add a new line so I can do a different PO. We'll go ahead and do that variance PO that we know about is down there. Loveman, and we have the $2,000 one. It's not registering that I've paid the $32,600 because I haven't posted it yet. But let's do the $2,000 one, which means we're staying all in budget and within POs, and we'll call this one PO827, and everything else filled in for us, but this is for soil conditions variance. You should be pretty specific in your descriptions, and the $2,000 came in. But I actually want to show you something. What if I put 6,000 here? And I go ahead and submit this. Look, we're getting a warning that it's over budget, it might be over POs, or change orders were found and various things. So I could pause to take a look at that and notice how right now it's telling me over budget by $4,000 with all of these things that I have on here. And it'll go and show me the stuff that I'm about to post, 38400 but it'll show me that ECC we've been looking at. And I could review that. If there had been other bills posted already, they'd be listed here also to show the bills so far. So it's warning me about that. It's also telling me that I'm over all the POs that have been issued. Two big buck. Because there could be a difference. Maybe you didn't issue POs for everything, but now it's going to tell me I can compare the POs and costs for this vendor and job. But we've been seeing that. Let's put this back to 2000 and what I'd like to do before I leave here is I'd like to add another line for another job because I'm going to demonstrate to you how you can do one check for multiple jobs and still track the cash for one job. So let's see if there's some other open POs for some other job here just because. Outstanding, whatever this one is, let's just do that one. I don't know what it's for or anything, but let's just say we're doing that one. It's checking everything is why it takes a minute, and I'll go PO908, but it filled everything in for me, so I can just keep going. I'm going to submit. I am getting an alert on just this Kennedy one, and I don't know anything about that, but it'd be the same thing where I could drill down to see if I still wanted to go ahead and support it. The other thing is... I can go ahead and write a comment right here saying this is over. You'll see that we're going to go over to the place for approval. I can upload copies of the bills for them to review and copies of this bill. I can make all sorts of comments that they can see when they're approving it. The other thing that we didn't go over is I could say, is this a back charge? Like say the $200, say I paid the $200 and then I wanted to back charge somebody else or something for the site cleanup if I was paying the site cleanup person. When I say yes, it'll ask for what vendor do we back charge in an amount over here. And it'll go post the back charge amount for us against somebody else as a minus amount to take away from a bill. So this will not ever look like a QuickBooks screen for entering bills. I'm going to pause this a minute. It's a screen that's designed for job costing and all sorts of things that will happen on this screen because we're a custom home builder business. Let's go ahead and submit all of these as unpaid and ignore the warning. Continue submit. Now you get some options when you're doing it. Post is unpaid to pay later, which is what we're going to do so that we can see them in an approval list. Right now, I could go ahead and go and print a check for the total of all of these together. Or I could mark them as paid by credit card, but keeping track of the job costs by vendor. Now if your customer had gone out and paid for something on their own, you might be entering something and posting it as paid by voucher. That means that there's going to be something happened behind the scenes to increase the revenues that we receive from the customer and to increase the cost and there will be no effect on a checking account or a credit card account. You can see how we're very much custom home people and we don't have to go anywhere else and make all kinds of spreadsheets to figure out things from credit cards or anything else. CHS is going to do that for you. In this case we're just going to post it as unpaid to pay later. So now that we posted those bills as unpaid to the slab contract, I reopened the estimated cost at completion worksheet and voila, here they are showing up under the actual costs. I don't have to go do anything else. CHS is just bringing those in. I can drill down and I can see the detail behind those costs 
and I can see that they are currently unpaid. I posted them as unpaid, and I can see that we took away 200. If I'm somebody else here, that can explain to me why this 34,600 for POs that is currently the ECC is over the amount for the actual costs. Now we know from looking at it and from everything else we've been looking at that these actual costs are actually done. There's not going to be any more costs, so I'd like to change the estimated cost at completion to be the same as the actual cost. I'm going to check mark that. Our POs went down by 1800 then we took 200 away, etc. And we ended up with the same as the 2000 variant, so we're not showing over anymore. So let's refresh the totals. Now notice we show over budget 1011, 28, which is these two, but if you have a whole bunch of them posted, which I don't, I've just been doing a demo, you can actually use a field search, go over here for the ECC over column, and do exclamation point equals zero, which is shown to you right down here in the tips means not equals to exclamation point equals zero and let's do a search that way we only see the ones that have something over or under budget and can see that that totals to our total over budget what's so cool about the ECC is way ahead of time every day you can see where you're headed based on what you've entered etc you can do a report of the results if you like, report research results and just look at the ones that are over under. Again, you can drill down to all of these things, look at comments, look at notes, look at what's behind all of them and what's causing either the overage or the under. Looks like we issued for the framing package total POs more than the original budget. And we did make that as an allowance on this fixed thing. So we have an agreement with the customer because of how framing lumber prices are so volatile right now that they're going to be paying whatever is over. So that can kind of explain a little bit about, you see that we're over budget here, but there's a profit difference. Now let's go ahead and show all for a second. And before I drill down on the profit difference, let's take a look at what's in change orders. We see $25,000, which is our cost for the change order, because this is an estimated cost at completion. But if I drill down, you're going to see we estimated the swimming pool that they wanted to add later at this amount, 25,000, and we charged 32% markup for some reason, and it's going to be 33,000 price to them. If you drill down here to see what this profit difference is, even though you're over costs, and since this is marked as a fixed contract, you'll see our original price, etc., original profit percent, but now here's our fixed price, plus the price for the change orders, plus an allowance adjustment for that lumber that's over. Because we do have an allowance agreement, please watch our video tutorials and training seminars for more information about allowances and how you can make an allowance agreement with the customer in your upfront contract and record that in CHS and give it some markup percent. If you drill down, you're going to see an analysis of everything that has been marked as an allowance. And the only one that's gone over right now is the framing package. So you can see how it's marked up 25% to add this much to the contract price. You can get a contract balance report right now. And you can see how we have the original price stuff, the current price, and less revenues received. 20000 is all we've received so far as the down payment. So let's take a look at something else. The profit and cash status. And you can see the original price, the revised price, the estimated cost of completion we've been looking at, the revised estimated profit. You can see the revised profit variance that we're actually getting more money now. The revenues received, revenues remaining received based on the revised price minus the revenues received, the actual job costs that have been paid, and then the costs remaining to pay, and then the net cash due in or out. And you can see what the cash balance is for the job, which essentially is easy to see right now is that we got 20,000 down and we paid this much in job costs and so you can see that's the cash balance but how smart CHS is about it and then also unpaid accounts payable and how much cash is available which is a minus amount to go ahead and pay those unpaid accounts now speaking of unpaid since we posted our stuff as unpaid look here how you see the cash balance you can see right here if you drill down to it 
that all we've done is post some things paid by the Visa credit card. We can drill down and see what was paid by credit card. And if there was any actual payables out of here, we'll come back and look at that. You'll see which cash account they came out of and what the cash balance is after that. So what you can do is drill down on your unpaid payables right here and see everything that has been posted as unpaid. Now this is why I say go ahead and post those bills as they come in so everybody can see them. We're about to go to the screen where the field can actually bring up the job cost bills for the Loveman job and review it all and check mark them as okay to pay or not. And then you can always delete or go adjust the bill that you entered. But I showed how you're doing so many things for the builder right away as you're entering the bills and you can spot overages and write notes and upload copies, etc. And you can't do that unless you go ahead and post the bills as they come in. Don't route around a big stack of bills that somebody has to say don't pay. Go ahead and enter them. And especially if you have POs, it'll be easy for you to figure out which cost code because it'll just drop in. That's another good, good reason for having POs so that you're not routing around a stack of bills to get them coded because you can see right away what they are. So now you can see job cost entered one time and it's showing up and affecting your ECC, affecting your profit calculation, showing everything that we need to do and this indicates that we need to do a draw request which will take a quick look at how CHS does that so well for you. But I'd like to go back to the jobs dashboard and I'd like you to see that right here for Loveman, if I am the builder that has been assigned to Loveman, I can drill down on the posted unpaid job costs so that I can give the bookkeeper some clue as to whether to pay them or not. Now you can see Big Buck right here, and you can see that they did get back charged by United Plumbing. Like I was explaining a minute ago, I was entering a bill to United Plumbing, and we decided to back charge Big Buck because we're paying for a little extra because they damaged something while they were doing the slab. So we're going to go ahead and probably approve that. It's already been approved by the field, OK2. You can use these OK1s and OK2s however you like, but I set them up sort of with the idea that the field might be doing an OK2, and then the big boss can come in on the big screen of all bills and do an OK1 so the bookkeeper knows what to pay. But notice how the field can drill down and see, yes, the PO, and drill down on the PO, Drill down to see the POs versus costs. Drill down to see the ECC for this cost code, which we've been looking at. Here's the line of the ECC, which is showing that it's not over budget right now. And we can see the unpaid amounts and what has been entered and explore that if we like. Drill down on the PO. If you're somebody needing to call Big Buck to talk about various things and look over things, you can bring up their contact information. You can look at other contacts they have in the office and you can see all sorts of past things and actual job costs and everything. Now, down here on these SunWest tile bills, you can see that there's paperclip icons. See how there's the bill to look at before approval so you don't have to route around the stack of bills. You can see that the office has made some comment or somebody's made comments. And you can look at a comments report real quick to see what the comments are. And you can see the vendor SunWest tile, they put 550 on the bill that was already included on their original bid, etc., etc., whatever notes you want. So let's go ahead and say OK to, to all of the big buck things right now. And let's exit. Now what I'd like you to see is if we go home and we go to unpaid payables, and we go to unpaid payables, and let's not just look at big buck, let's go ahead and look at all unpaid payables, but we could have just looked at big bucks if we'd like. But this might be, first of all, where the big boss comes and looks at every single thing and checks mark, check marks OK1. This takes a higher level of permission. The big boss or the bookkeeper is in here. There's a column here that's called to pay. So you could select things to pay, and they've gone ahead and done some. Let's go down to Big Buck and see how nothing is selected to pay. Now, let's say all, that we want to select all of the Big Buck to pay. And I'd like you to notice that Selected to Pay has a Campman job in it for $70,000 and that 02 Kennedy one that we entered. And I'm going to unselect that one to pay because it was just a thing I wanted to show you about how we could add another job. This is how easily you can delete an unpaid one if you have a high level of permission. Notice that this check for Big Buck, if I pay all of these things on one check, we'll have a part of it that's for the Campman job. So let's go ahead and say 
that we just want to pay big buck right now so we don't have a whole lot of other stuff involved in our demo so I'm just going to do payment and I can do print or post check or I could post it all as paid by a credit card if I called up big buck and gave him a credit card number for this but let's do post or print check and I'm going to put 46228 because I'm looking at my stack of checks is the check that I'm going to put in my printer to print if I continue to print checks I can look to see if the check looks okay it's showing on the stub the various different jobs and cost codes that were used and I could use my print button but I'm not really printing a check because I'm doing a demo and don't have a check but I'm going to go ahead and say yes the checks ran okay so post them as paid if I did a bunch of checks I could get a list real quick of all the checks that would be a whole list that I had paid today now I want to show you something else about looking at a list of checks you can go here to the check register list of checks and let's just say I want to do from today to today and open a list of checks what I'd like to show you now is another thing about entering a job cost one time you don't have to go put all kinds of things together to figure out what was paid on a check you can drill down to the detail there's the cost that we paid that we entered love and love and love and showing up and showing us the detail behind the check now what if I want to know how much is just for one job on a check let's select the job loveman now you can see various checks going on here because I said I wanted to see all the checks for one job and the detail behind the check but notice this check I just did is just showing me the part that is for Loveman so you can print a report of all of this to somebody that you're showing the checks you've written for the job to give them the right amounts but let's go ahead and say paid check detail for selected job and you can send a report of all these things that you've paid for Loveman so far if you send it to PDF it'll be formatted better and there'll be a signature here that they put in their footer but you might be ending up making a bunch of Excel spreadsheets trying to figure out how much you paid for that job especially if you paid for more than one job on one check but CHS is taking it for you and handling it gives you a nice little summary of those also without all the detail behind the checks and you can send all of those to PDF and send them off to somebody else so I wanted to show you how much detail you can get about the checks and behind the checks without a bunch of Excel spreadsheets so in addition to knowing about how much is on each check for each job we can do waivers of lien no matter how many jobs we did on one check but based on the checks you can set up some waiver styles based on your state requirements various different styles give them names let's take a look at setting up this one just for one second and if you see page one you'll see that there's various value markers you can stick in the middle bring in the verbiage that your state requires we can't provide one for you because we're not attorneys and we get in trouble for that but you set up your styles and then I'm gonna do a conditional progress page two there's final waivers that you can do and set up those styles too once you're done with the job and you want a whole big lump sum for waivers and do the verbiage for those etc but let's open the progress waivers for a range of dates that I did see those back here and I, I did say yes that I wanted to track these waivers now notice that what is showing up here for today is just the one check that we did the check number but it is split into the two different jobs so I can do a waiver for Campman I can do a waiver for Loveman let's take a quick look at that if I open it up you'll see the various things with all the amounts thrown in there and just the amount for Loveman is on here and this is a two page because they decided to split the part for the notary into the second page when they set up their style so let's close that and let's close that and close that and then it has said yes that it would be there in the tracking table so I can open the waivers tracking I think I have some really old ones in here and stuff but you can see this one right up here ready to say we returned now I would get warned about big buck for a couple of them like I did that we have open waivers that haven't been marked as returned and it will let you go to this table and set the return date let's play like we got that one back today so it wouldn't actually show up as a warning about outstanding waivers so that's how simple that is you can do all kinds of things with that tracking table but I just wanted to insert that and see show you again how smart CHS is about splitting things by jobs even though they're on one check
So the next thing I'd like to show you is we paid the check. So let's go back to the ECC and watch this line. Notice how it right now thinks that outstanding is this much and that the amount paid is zero. But if we refresh, we see that showing as paid is this much and outstanding is this much because our ECC is 34,400 and this is no longer outstanding. Now if we drill down on the cash again, we see our cash balance has now gone to 18,000. And you can see right here payables showing up out of the checking account that we did and what was paid and grouped by vendor. If there had been more than big buck paid out of that checking account, you'd start seeing groups of them and how much was paid. So you can see the detail behind where that cash balance is coming from. Now, we really didn't have enough to pay these checks. And we should have gone and done a draw request first, but I'm trying to show you everything related to the payables. But normally you would have noticed this here, said I need to go do a draw request. So now I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to the home menu. And I'm going to go to the place to produce draw requests. So Lebman is a fixed contract and I can click this first button. And because it's fixed, I'm going to say I want to do a percent complete draw request. If it was cost plus, the first thing that would happen, that which is not what this is, is you'd get a list of all the costs ready to draw that have not been drawn before. But what I get for percent complete is a place that I can enter percents complete. I've actually sat and entered a bunch of them already, so ready to draw is a bunch. So you don't have to have actual costs posted to enter percents complete, but you can see that on the slab contract, it shows 43,000, and we know that this is 100% complete, and I can drill down on the actual cost marked up. See how it's actual cost? and then marked up amount. And if I click on the percent complete for this, I can say that I want to use 100% and change this to be drawing 43. So you get the idea, I could I could know without posting costs that 50% of the framing package is done, or I want to draw ahead of time for it, I could put 50% on here, or 100%, and change all kinds of things, but I won't take all your time to do that. Hopefully you get that idea. Now it says ready to draw 101, that looks nice. So let's store print and post draw request with revenues and change orders. Let's open the draw request, take a look at it, and you'll see it's draw request 1, 101,000. It's showing prior draws of 0. Next time when you do draw 2, it's going to move amounts over into the prior draws and then show how much you're taking this time, etc., etc. It'll come down with the totals, 101. It'll be showing all your cost codes. And I'd like to mention as you see all these various cost codes and cost groups, don't think that these are the ones that you have to use. This builder did load the recommended NAHB cost codes and then tweaked them as needed, which we let you do. You can load the NAHB or you can set those up from scratch. Here's the money you've received so far, and here's the detail of change orders attached to this draw request. So let's go ahead and let's exit this. And we reviewed it all, so we don't need to review it all, but let's say yes, post the draw request. If we have some problem with it, we could go back and reprint the draw. It's not posted yet, but let's post it. That means it'll be in a list of draw requests that you see now. You can drill down and open the draw document again, but this is now stored in your file cabinet, and you can send it to the home buyer. So let's play like we have a great home buyer in Loveman, and send us a check for the total draw amount. So let's mark this as draw received and let's go over and post the money that we received really quickly. I'm not going to dwell on this one too much. We're just going to go over here, add a new deposit. I'm going to select the payer Loveman. Notice that based on the payer I selected, a job dropped in, the department connected to the job dropped in. Let's play like their check is four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we're going to just say draw one Loveman. And we're going to call it interim draw because we set up a deposit category for interim draw. And you can watch some of our other videos about how you can do that, which makes it so that the thing connected with that deposit category drops in as construction loans payable. In this case, that's what they've decided to have those posted to. And the amount of that they sent us is 101,566.26. And we're ready to go. Let's put it into the bank account BOA construction. And let's say the deposit date is the day I was making this just a couple of days ago, I think. Let's just say it was that day. And we're going to submit the deposit. That's how easy it is. It's going to say the resulting cash balance in the bank account 
and I'm going to close the deposits menu. So what I'd like to do is jump back to the ECC for Job Loveman that I've had open all along and once again I need to refresh it because I've had it open in a tab and it's just been sitting here. So let's refresh everything. Now notice that we had those payables we looked at that the cash balance is currently 83566 and if we paid with the outstanding payables that we drilled down on here, we'd still have 47000 left. Let's take a look at the cash balance breakdown by cash account and credit card account. Now we see the deposits right here, and we can see contract deposits, down payment, and then we can see the draw one, and we can see the total of those monies received. Just wanted you to see that, so now we are in place with this one with more money ready to go. I'd like to jump back real quick to the draw request menu to show you one that is a cost plus draw. So I'd like to select Smith John cost plus fee and show you what happens with a cost plus builder fee just super fast. Let me go ahead and click prepare new draw request. Let's just say today. And I'd like you to see that the first thing that opens here is a list of all costs that have not been drawn yet and they're all selected to be included on the draw. If you don't want to include some of them, you don't have to. This is a whole completely different kind of job, but CHS is real smart about doing this. If I continue to the draw worksheet, this is a cost plus builder fee, so we're going to see the amounts at the cost. We continue to calc a builder fee based on a builder fee that we assigned of 92000 CHS is calculating the portion of the builder fee to do this time if you want, or you can type in your own. Use calculated fee, and let's do with revenue CO's report. Let's take a quick look at it. And this is a little bit of a different animal, and it's showing the prior draws, and it's calculating what percent you've drawn of the budget amount, etc. so far. But it's showing everything by those cost codes with the prior draws, but what I'd like to show you is the difference at the bottom, and it's saying builder fee right here. And here's the amount we selected to include, here's the prior amounts we've drawn, so it's adding those to the bottom of the actual cost, the actual bills that we've posted and drawn. So let's close that. Let's say yes, post the draw request. And what's very cool is you can get the cost detail. You can do the actual costs only for cost plus fee with attachments. You can just see a detail of all the costs that were included in the draw. And if you were doing the uploading of things and sent this to PDF, here's an attachment that's a copy of the bill from Clayton Construction. And you can have a whole bunch of them here. It's just that I'm not a real builder, like I say, so I don't have a whole bunch. You send the detail of this draw to your home buyer and imagine that they can drill down on a copy of every single bill that is included on here. Just wanted to show you how detailed that is. Now, if I go ahead and check mark, let's check mark that this one has been received, but this one has not. I'd like you to see something else about this job. Back on the jobs dashboard, let's select Smith John. And let's take a quick look at the actual job cost database, but what I'd like you to see over here is see the five, that draw number five is what we just did, cost plus draw. One, five, one, five, three. You can see which ones have been included on what draw, and you can search for ones that are just on a certain draw, so you could get a list of all the actual costs here. The other important thing I wanted you to see is approved posted job costs, unpaid, and you can see that these are all on draw five that we just did. Now I'd like to tell you if I, if I had marked it that the draw had been received, these would all be in green. So you can see how it gives more information to the person that is approving the bills to pay if it's important that you have received the draw that these costs have been included in. Please watch the video tutorials about draw requests. You can see them here. Behind help, you'll be able to open all the tutorials about the various kinds of draws and the various types of jobs and contracts to see which one you might want to be using. So let's move on. Now the other places that we can see that bill showing up, I'm just now going to start zooming through some things, is over here on Vendor Setup and Info. You can see that there's vendor insurance. Let's play like we have a policy period from 1001-2022-0930-2023. Let's go to a general liability audit. I don't have hardly any bills in here, but what you can see is big bucks showing up with a whole bunch of stuff in that policy period time, which was just today. But you can see that you would have all kinds of vendors listed here 
and the amounts that have been paid, actually paid to them, not the unpaid, but the paid amounts, and a bunch of information about it, and printed a report for the auditor, just a general liability audit report. There would show the certificate here, and you could print a report of the transaction ledger of search result, various things that show the vendor payments, summed by cost type, that's where I was saying you could break it into materials and labor, which might do a good thing for you. But you can print reports that give the little icons to the short URL for copies of the bills. But notice how fast those, that one showed up in our audit report and a workers comp audit report would be the same. I didn't have to go make any other spreadsheets to handle that. Let's also look at back home, a really cool thing for the accountants is something called work in progress trial balance by job. Let's see it today. Let's go ahead and go to the active list so you can see how wonderfully active that is. For the accountants, this is your all of your accounts on your chart of accounts and it's broken down by how much is in there for each job. Now notice down here we have our Loveman job and if I drill down to the total in this account for it, you can see all the detail behind that, including our Loveman ones that we were entering today. So entered one time and is now showing up as the detail in the GL account that we were using for that. And the other place that is so cool for accountants is that when you're ready to close the job, we're not ready to close Loveman yet, but we're going to go ahead and open the screen so that you accountants can see that we're going to just say today's date, we're closing it, we're not really going to post it, but let's do Loveman. And I'd like you to see that you can get a full trial balance just for the job. You can see the various things and the amounts we've kind of been looking at in the deposit we saw. These are all the accounts that are on, that are balance sheet accounts that you, might, you will be closing. When you continue to the job closing window, play like this job has had all kinds of stuff happen already to it. You would click to create a JE and say, I'm sending this to cost of sales probably. If this was a big sales price, you'd click to create a JE, send it to sales, and CHS completely gathers all those numbers for you to do the job closing. You can review the actual job cost database for the job if you want to, just to feel comfortable about it. The contract balance and revenues report that we saw before, which should be showing you about the amount that is due, which hopefully is zero by the time you're doing the job closing entry. But you can review all kinds of things with that job closing, but what I hated doing was having to go search out throughout all my accounting records the balances for each job so that I could do the job closing entry. There's another really powerful place for uh, accountants that are doing percentage of completion method. I won't explain it. Please watch our training tutorials, but I'm just going to go ahead and give a big wide range of dates here. I want you to see something. Notice our Lubman job right here. Current period costs incurred during the range of dates. Usually you do a month at a time. You'd see prior period costs from previous to the date that I used to start this. Job to date costs. You'll see the revenues estimate. This is that revised price we were looking at. This stuff will be taken and figured out that based on the ECC that we've been looking looking at that this is 17.07 percent complete and it'll do a calculation of how much revenue we earned during current periods then you click to view JE or to create a JE now I used to spend a week or so at the end of every month gathering all these numbers and trying to figure them out if you drill down again you can see all of the detail of the job costs that you just posted one time, there's our stuff again for the Loveman job. And it's showing up. It's helping you calculate everything. It'd be a bunch of other costs too. But you can't believe how much time this can save you if you are involved in doing percentage of completion entries every month to recognize so much of your revenue and so much of your costs on your income statement every single month, which is highly recommended by construction consultants to be able to see how much you earned each month and move it instead of just doing what is called the completed contract method where you are doing that job closing journal entry only at the end of the job. So let's wrap this one up. 
This video was supposed to be about entering job costs and having those show up all over the place without creating all kinds of spreadsheets with a little additional information. Now, of course, we didn't touch on everything, like making journal entries, editing various entries, and on and on and on. But what I wanted to get across was posting those job cost bills one time and having them show up everywhere because those are usually the things that you're entering twice and double time and triple time into Excel spreadsheets to come up with various things that you saw CHS do without you having to do those spreadsheets. And why I've brought you to our website where we advertise CHS is that there's a features button. And in this is a full seminar that I used to do for two to three days just to teach people. It has all been spit out on videos. If you'd like to learn more about any of the things that we went over, there's much more detail about it here. And if you'd like to know more about posting the deposits or how to post monies received, you can certainly do that. Track cash by job, how to post monies received is in this particular video in 11. But if I were you and I was considering purchasing a software and a job costing and accounting software, I would have your staff come here and review this seminar as if they're going to the seminar so that you can make a good decision about whether CHS is a good fit for you. It is a powerful accounting that is meant to replace your generic accounting software. A lot of people have an accounting system set up and say, well, we already have one, but if I ask them, they will say they're making tons of spreadsheets. So they will recognize when they watch this what CHS is actually doing for them. And they may be willing to replace their accounting just to save all of the time that it will save. Thank you for watching and I wish you the best success with your business.